All right, so in this Deeper Look video, we're going to think a little bit more about stellar evolution and kind of summarize in one really big, kind of busy flow chart, everything that we need is the absolute essentials from chapters uh, 21 through, through 24. So we're going to start out with the very beginning, how stars form. And I'm going to find the corner of the screen. There we go. And stars form out of clouds and gas, of gas and dust in the interstellar medium. So the interstellar medium, there are large, giant, giant uh, molecular clouds. So giant molecular clouds have dense cores in them. So dense cores in giant molecular clouds. That's where we actually see dense enough gas and dust that we can form stars from them. When there is some shock wave that passes through those dense cores, then because of, so uh, we find the best regions in the interstellar medium to make stars. We need to have a shock wave um, cause collapse. And then we get a protostar. And that idea of a protostar is really important to us because a protostar means that we don't yet have a star. And that helps remind us that there has to be a definition of when a star turns on. And that definition is when stars are able to turn hydrogen into helium in their cores. And so a protostar is when we still have this larger object that is collapsing down and its core is heating up. And so this protostar will collapse further and heat up. And then we get to make a star. All right. So that's sort of the very basics of um, star formation. There's lots more details that we uh, talked about in the lecture videos. And there's even more videos that we didn't even mention in the lecture videos um, that are outside the scope of this class. But you need to have stuff in a dense enough region to be able to collapse down to form a protostar, and then you're able to turn on hydrogen to helium fusion. Remember, we need hydrogen to helium fusion to call these a star. Okay, now the really key thing is that this star is going to be on the main sequence. So if we think about our Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, so a really, really tiny little Hertzsprung-Russell diagram here, temperature um, counting up backwards from what we think, luminosity um, going from dim up to bright. We have the main sequence, main sequence, and that's where stars spend most of their lifetimes. So this star is going to be on the main sequence, so a main sequence star, and it will have some spectral type. We talked about those spectral types when we talked about temperature, uh, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. And those, uh, that star will be on the main sequence for 90% of its overall lifetime, so main sequence star. But then when stars leave the main sequence, because they've run out of hydrogen to helium fusion, so run out of hydrogen, then they leave the main sequence and they go to become larger stars. So we might go kind of up or over, but in all of those cases, we're going up to larger stars. We're going to simplify those and call them all red giants. There are super giants uh, and whatnot, but we're just going to say that all stars become larger and colder, and that idea is encompassed within the idea of red giants. Now, this is really where we get to um, not just the rest of our discussion of chapters 22, 23, and 24, but it's also going to take us through the Stellar Evolution Lecture Tutorial. So if you haven't tried that one yet um, and you're going to, then kind of hold off on this video uh, until you get to it. 
So um, for the uh, red giant stars, they are going to be our sort of summary of all of the different types of stars, whether they're small stars or big stars. And so those small stars we're going to put up here at the top. So if the mass of those stars is less than three solar masses, then we're going to end up with a planetary nebula for its outer layers. Oops. I'll write that again right below it because I'm not sure if it's um, visible or not. And for that planetary nebula, um, that's the outer layers of that star that's um, forming that planetary nebula. And so that leaves behind then, it leaves behind a white dwarf, and that's really important to us. Okay. So for these low mass stars, that's what they do, and that's going to be um, what the sun does when it dies. However, for low, for low mass stars leaving behind white dwarfs, we'll talk more about what we can do with white dwarfs um, afterwards. But for now, let's jump to um, if we have high mass stars. So if we have, so if the mass is greater than three solar masses, then when the star dies, it's going to create a type two supernova. Okay. And that type 2 supernova is the core collapse supernova when the, the star goes through not just hydrogen to helium fusion and for red giants we're um, typically able to go through helium to carbon fusion uh, in the core. But for type 2 supernova, we were able to go all the way up until iron. So after we make iron infusion, then we have this type 2 supernova. And then there's a split. We can leave behind two possibilities. We can leave behind a um, black hole. And that's if we have the very most massive stars uh, possible. So that might have been cut off, uh, but we'll hope for the best. And uh, that's if the core is um, greater than about three solar masses. So this is if the star mass is greater than three. This is if the core mass. So if the star mass. Okay, and then the other possibility is we leave behind a neutron star. All right, so that neutron star, and again, kind of cut off, neutron star, uh, is if we have a core, so if the core mass is less than three solar masses, but greater than that, um, greater than that 1.4 solar mass uh, limit that we talked about. So I know that this seems fairly complicated, and it is, right? Because this is chapter 21, chapter 22, chapter 23, and chapter 24, kind of the key ideas from those chapters. Now, the important thing to realize is that there's not just these things that we talked about, but there's a couple of other things to consider. And this is going to get even busier. Uh, and remember, one of the nice things about these Deeper Look videos is you can always rewind to where things seemed clearer and then go at the pace that you need to to make sure that you kind of agree and understand everything that's written down here. So um, for these, and I'll make sure that it, this is not cut off. That's the one problem with having a finite size for this thing. Okay. The additional information that we have that we can think about is what happens with white dwarfs 
and what happens with um, black holes and even with neutron stars too. With white dwarfs, if they are by themselves in space, then uh, they'll just stay white dwarfs. However, if they have a binary companion, so if they have a binary companion, then there's two things that could happen to them. They can either make a nova, and that's going to be a surface layer of fusion. It's going to be the controlled um, fusion that leaves behind the white dwarf. And so that's basically something that can go back and be done over and over and over again. Or we can have a type 1A supernova. And that's when we go past that um, limit. I tried to get it on. We'll see. Um, that's when we go past that limit. There's nowhere for me to stand. That type 1a supernova is when we go over that 1.4 solar masses. 1.4 solar masses. And the white dwarf is destroyed. The type 1a supernova then leads to an absence of white dwarf. The other thing on this um, sheet is if we have a black hole that has a binary companion, we can observe a black hole binary or an X-ray binary system. X-ray binary is a possibility for these black holes. X-ray binary. And those are the two main ideas that we wanted to add to this flowchart um, from the lecture tutorial. But one last thing that we can add for neutron stars is it is possible to have a pulsar if we have a very highly magnetic and rapidly rotating neutron star. So those orange additions are kind of possibilities beyond the end result where it's really important to recognize that those end results, so we've got the white dwarf, we've got the neutron star, and we've got the black hole. Those are the three big stellar remnant end results that we can have. And anything beyond that are sort of details of what can happen to a white dwarf or a neutron star or a black hole. The lowest mass stars, medium mass stars, and the very highest mass stars will leave behind a black hole. That's all we've got for you. It's a lot, but remember, you can always go back and rewind to uh, when there was less here and we built it up from scratch. That's it.